everybody. I wanted to do a quick little intro to this month's meeting. This isn't a topic we normally cover in a Premiere Pro user group, but I think it is something that is extremely valuable to everybody out there. Whether you run a small production company or you're just a freelancer working on your own, getting the word out about you and your business and the services that you have to offer, even if you're a freelancer, you need to think of yourself as a business. This meeting is for you. The information that we talk about in it is designed to help you get the word out and get more people finding you online. Because let's face it, if you don't have a good website that's showcasing your work that people can see, you're not going to get hired. You know, I'm a firm believer in word of mouth. I've built my business on word of mouth advertising, but I couldn't really get anywhere without a website that showcases my work that people can find when they're searching for video production services. So knowing how to use social media, uh, marketing, SEO, all of the stuff that we talk about in this meeting is vital for you to increase your you know, profitability, to, to go out and find new clients and, and stay in business. Even if you just see yourself as a filmmaker who just wants to go make movies, you still need to know how to market those movies and reach an audience. And a lot of the tools that we talk about in this month's meeting are going to apply to that as well. So sit back, enjoy the meeting, and take some notes. I know, as I mentioned during the meeting a couple times, I'm going to go back and rewatch it just so I can get a handle on some of the stuff that he's talking about and really start to apply some of these techniques to my own business. We'll see you next month. Welcome, everybody, to this month's meeting. Um, what I didn't realize when we scheduled this meeting was that tonight is the 48-hour film project screening. I think it's the final screening series, so I'm sure a bunch of people are there. So if you're at, if you went to that and are watching the recording of this, thanks for showing up. Hope you enjoyed your movie. I'm kidding. I hope you really enjoyed your movie. Um, so a couple things. Um, we were going to talk about, um, and I'll put this out for the recording, um, people as well. Um, next month's meeting is our member showcase and we put up something on the Facebook page, but we want to get everybody's feedback about whether we want to meet in person, um, to show people's work. Um, I don't know who's comfortable with that, who's uncomfortable with that. Um, you know, we were thinking about doing it at a movie theater seeing everybody's work on a big screen we thought that would be kind of fun but i don't want to go through dj and i don't want to go through the hoops of trying to plan all this if nobody wants to you know sit in a movie theater with a bunch of other people right now so um so please let us know give us feedback email myself or dj um, or put comments on our facebook page and let us know or the meetup page and let us know if you are comfortable with meeting in person um, the other thing, too, for next month's meeting is to start thinking about topics for 2021 um, so that we can start planning meetings for that. Think about what we want to what you'd like to learn about and share. I actually went through, DJ, the list from from last year for this year, and we actually got a lot of the stuff we wanted. There's only a few things on there that were like, oh, we didn't do that or we didn't do that or we, we didn't do that. And some of the the only big name guests I think that we had on that list that we didn't get was Jason Levine. Um, and you know, we'll keep working for that. So, yeah. um, but other than that, oh, and then max Adobe max is next month. So if you haven't signed up for that, it's free. So please sign up for that. It's going to be great. Um, and now with no NAB, uh, what else are you going to do? So, um, which I'm kind of DJ, I don't know how you, you don't really go to NAB. So, you know, I don't know if that's something you really care about, but like for me, I'm kind of kind of mixed feelings on that. Like I want to go, um, you know, I was planning kind of on going this year. Um, it, it just kind of falls at a bad time for me, but yeah, no, I'm bummed about it, but it's the way things are going to be for a bit, I believe. So Juan, Juan Salvo posted on uh, Twitter today that he thinks within 10 years that trade in-person trade shows like NAB will be a thing of the past and will be sort of novel. Like I think he equated it to vinyl, buying a vinyl, you know, an album. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if I agree with that as I've been thinking about it all day, I tend to think that they're still going to be around. There's still a value to getting together in person. I agree. But I, I think, uh, I mean, I remember when Adobe max went, you know, online, I, pretty much resigned myself that I've gone to the last Adobe Max just because I don't think that the the cost involved 
and you know is so different i mean i don't really get online experiences like that too well like to me it's like a really well curated youtube playlist but um you know people respond to them i suppose and it's free and you know it's it's all about the corporate messaging anyway yeah so they're still getting their word out you gotta wonder though how much longer adobe max is going to be free like if this i can't see this extending into a year from now where we're dealing with this but then again if you'd asked me a year ago if i thought we'd still be dealing with it now i would have said no but i have to think that if we're still kind of in a mess in a situation like this a year from now that adobe is going to say okay we gave you two years for free but this year we gotta we gotta get a little bit of scratch from you but i don't know we'll see i mean it's not like they're short of cash but uh, no no idea i hope not yeah i mean I hope not. I mean, I, yeah, I hope I hope that we're going back to getting beers with people that I only meet uh, once a year because yes. of events. Yes. See, that's, <laughs> but, that's, the, that's the thing. And then we'll we'll move on and get this meeting started. But that's to me, that's the beauty of NAB yeah. Max is seeing people that you that you don't get to see any other time that you just talk to through Twitter or Behance or Facebook or whatever. So you talk to people through Behance? I I don't, but oh, okay. I'm, I'm sure people do, don't they? I mean. Like, yeah, I mean, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> we, I'm not fancy like that. So. <laughs> we should probably, we should probably scrub that being that Venus is owned by Adobe now. So <laughs> cut that out later. Maybe an edit. Somebody at Adobe's like, yeah, is, Behance is super fancy and I love it. Can't wait to, uh, you know, use it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Behance is great. Um, okay. On that note, let's get this meeting started. So I, totally screwed up and don't have Jeff's bio in front of me. So DJ, you don't have it in front of you, do you? I don't, but I do have my email in front of me so I can grab it real quick. Cause I'm well, like so that. DJ is more ready for this meeting than apparently I am. I'm going to let DJ introduce Jeff, our guest for this evening. Things no one has ever said. Okay. So <laughs> Jeffrey for, for, uh, Fox received his BBA in business administration with an emphasis on marketing and international business from the University of San Diego. After receiving his degree, he worked with Studio 2055, a Carlsbad, North County represent based marketing and graphic design company with clients such as 20th Century Fox and the California Center for the Arts, the Four Seasons, the Gemological Institute of America, Reebok and Taylor Made. As the Director of Marketing and the VIP of Operations for Princebury Productions and Media, he developed and implemented a national marketing plan and was the project manager for the creation of a $100 million film fund. Jeff is the Executive Director of the Princebury Film Festival, which focuses on fam family-friendly, uplifting content. Utilizing his knowledge in filmmaking, along with his marketing expertise, Jeff went on to create Star Fox Media, a marketing and video production company that focuses on helping local small businesses. Nope, and you're muted now. Well done, good job. Yeah, it was a, a family. I was good until family friendly, and then it just kind of fell apart from there. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, with that, uh, Jeff, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you for the the kind introduction. It always feels so awkward hearing about yourself when you're sitting there. It's fantastic. Um, so. As DJ just said, I'm I'm Jeff Fox. Um, I run Star Fox Media as the as the, the my current um, thing that I'm doing. But um, I just thought I'd come and talk to you guys a little bit about about marketing, small business marketing in particular. I'll bring up my presentation really quick. Um, and I'm gonna kind of take this from the perspective of you know. I'm, I'm in a room full of, you know, editors. Uh, a lot of people here are either freelance or, you know, start or maybe run their own small businesses. And so a lot of the things that I'll talk about today can be used by you guys to take your skills and think about it not only as a commodity, but also as a business and figure out how to um, get more clients, how to market yourself. And then a lot of your clients are also like you know, a lot of the videos you might be doing could be for video for marketing purposes. So having a little bit of this background and knowledge will help you when you're doing some editing as well. Um, so uh, let's just start that off. Um, you guys already kind of did the bio, but um, this is me. Um, I, like you said, I graduated USD, worked for you know, all those. I don't need to read that again, but 
Um, long story short, I went to college, I came out, I went into the film industry and I ended up doing marketing for the film industry. Um, and while doing all the marketing business fun stuff, I tried to come back and learn a little bit more about um, the creative side of the film industry. So I took classes in, you know, editing and video uh, cinematography and all that to kind of just, I mean, as a producer, I wanted to know if I was hiring good people, basically. So I kind of learned all that side, mostly just to be a better producer. And then um, basically, you know, and everyone here kind of knows how the film industry is. It's like, you know, you'll have a big project and then like in between projects, there's a big trough of, of a whole lot of nothing. Um, so I was doing marketing for small businesses on the side as a freelancer with Star Fox Marketing. And uh, during the, you know, the year of COVID, I, uh, all, the, all the theaters were shut down. I was trying to pitch films to investors like, hey, give me 15 million for this theatrical film we're making. And they'd be like, theaters are closed. And I'd be like, yeah, that's true. And they'd be like, I don't wanna give you any money. It's like, okay. So um, I thought I'd concentrate more on that, uh, the whole marketing um, side of business and, um, use that film knowledge and the creative knowledge that I used or that I've gained from working in the film industry, pair that with my marketing knowledge and be able to help, uh, small, like small businesses and brands tell their stories. So that's kind of enough about me. Um, today I was going to talk about kind of, there's, there's three big things when it comes three, three main pieces of marketing. There's your strategy, there's your branding, and then there's the actual marketing techniques that you use. So I'm gonna quickly go over all three of those. If I can do it as quickly as possible, I'm going to try so that maybe I can take some questions. And um, if anyone has specific questions about their business, it's actually more fun to use real life examples anyway. So, um, so let's, let's, let's get it started. Um, first, uh, I think we should talk about what is marketing? What are your goals of, like, what is the purpose of marketing? Why do people do it? Um, there's a thing called the marketing flywheel or it used to be the marketing funnels and they kind of updated the, the language on that because, uh, so I'll use those terms kind of interchangeably today, but there's, um, but they'll have, they have different meanings and I'll explain kind of what that is. And then I'll also talk about the importance of your target market and why, you know, you really, really, really need to know who your customer is. Um, and let's get started. So as a marketer, as a business owner who needs to do your own marketing, you know, what should be your goals? Because there's, depending on what your goal is with your marketing, there's, you're going to do, you're going to want to take different um, strategies and different techniques to achieve those. So for example, if you're trying to create brand awareness, you might not care about quite as much about having a hard sales pitch in it or a really strong call to action. And You'll want to concentrate more on making content that is has you know virality, has um, that adds value, um, things like giving people information for free, things like those where it's you're trying to create awareness about your brand, find things that are shareable and um, that people will want to actually consume and watch because all the social media platforms uh, are always trying to push content out that people like. And so that's kind of their goal is to push content that people actually want or people like, which they do by seeing how many people watch it and all the way through and everything. So that's, you know, if you're trying to create brand and awareness, whereas if you're trying to build just sales, like you're just at the end of the day, you know, a lot of times marketing is to bring more money in the door. And that's so you can keep your doors open and keep doing what you love. And so if you're doing that, you might want to go a little stronger with the call to actions. You might be wanting to target your, you know, make your content for people that are a little bit further along in the buying process um, that already know they have, you know, an issue that your, you know, brand solves. So if you're, I mean, since everyone here is kind of is specifically, it sounds like in the video editing um, and, you know, I guess mostly video editing, but probably graphics and all those kinds of wonderful ancillary um, post-production work kinds of things. Um, you know, your target market might be other businesses. It might be things like producers where you need to get hired by producers. So you don't really need to target the general public, the general consumer, you need to target, you know, other producers. So, um, that's, um, that's one of the goals of, of marketing. And so I guess 
the way that I wrote that down was to move customers through your marketing flywheel, which I haven't explained what that is yet. So I'll just probably do that right now. Um, so what a flywheel, the, the, the traditional um, view of marketing is there's a marketing funnel or a sales funnel. And the way that that works is you know, you have your people that don't even know who you are. They don't know they need a pro that they need your your product or service as a solution. Um, they basically are just you know the general public. And to get them into your funnel, they first need to just know you exist. And so the top of your funnel is usually awareness. It's usually um, trying to show them that you know they may have a problem that they didn't know about, like hey, if you had more video on your website, you'd have more sales. And it's like, oh, is that, that's true? I didn't even know that was true. So they, they're not looking for you as you as a service solution because they don't even know they have a, a marketing pro or that they have a, a problem in their business that they could solve using your, your service. So that's like the top of the funnel. But as you get, you move them through that funnel, you get them closer and closer to, oh, I do want to get some more video on my website. There's a million different video companies and producers, and each of those um, companies has options of different editors. How do they, you get them to select you? And so there's like getting them down that funnel. And then the last step of the funnel is getting them to convert into actually giving you a check. So um, that's kind of the standard marketing funnel. The difference between a marketing funnel and a marketing flywheel is that they've discovered that when you get someone through the marketing funnel, all they do is go into your sales funnel and you have to move them through that. And then after you get them through your sales funnel, they actually have now hired you. They've, um, they like your services and they go through what's they consider the customer service funnel now. So they have a, a um, you, you provide your service. They like it. Um, you try to get them to give you reviews. You try to get them to tell their friends, become a, a brand evangelist for you. And that fun, uh, funnels more people into the top of your marketing funnel. So that's why they call it a flywheel because it's supposed to keep feeding on itself and getting bigger and bigger. Um, now, marketing has a, a few different kinds of uh, techniques. There's the traditional outbound marketing where you're you know, putting, placing ads places. Most, for the most part, it's advertising is traditional outbound marketing. Um, Star Fox Media, we like to really concentrate more on inbound marketing. And the idea of inbound marketing is creating content um, products and services, but mostly content that attracts people to you instead of putting things out and paying to get it in front of other people. So for example, in the video world, if you're making really good informational videos, then people who are searching a problem will Google that problem. Your video might pop up, they watch it, and then they'll make like your website will be on there if you basically solve the problem for them, and they uh, or you figured, you made sure to let them know that you had a problem, or that they have a problem that you can solve. Then maybe they'll click your website and hire you. So um, outbound marketing is re is going out into the marketplace and trying to find your customers. Inbound marketing is creating a really solid foundation of content and um, information and posts that brings people to into your space. Uh, and so yeah, here's the um, a diagram of the flywheel. So again, it's like you attract people, you engage uh, is your marketing process, you engage with them, that's your sales process, you delight uh, process, you delight them, and you know that's your customer service process. So, um, but to do that, to like actually know what kind of content to create, what kind of things to put into the, uh, what kind of content to put out in to build your foundation with, you really have to have a strong understanding of who your target market is. And, you know, there's, there's lots of different people that come that you're trying to bring to your website. I mean, it could be just straight your customers, which, you know, that's, that's number one, obviously. Um, but as you can see here, there's like, you know, if you want to bring other like media services to you, if you need investment, um, if you're looking for partnerships, any kinds of other, um, parties that you want to bring to your website or have any kinds of relationships with at all, you need to kind of think as them as a target market and figure out how you're going to get them to your website, where they're going to click, where you, and are, do you have a page for them basically. And for each of your main target markets, what we recommend you do is you create a buyer or customer persona. And what a, pers a customer persona is, is, is it's literally you just think of like, you know, who are some of your best customers? And then you kind of create an, 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 a fake 
person that has the criteria, a, com a culmination of all of your best customers and clients, and what kinds of things they have in common. Are they all from the same job position? Like, I mean, it sounds like, again, since this is all post-production and editing kind of things, you know, if you're specifically getting, getting hired by production companies or producers, you know exactly who your target market is. They all share the same job role. And so maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. I might, I mean, I'm not an editor by trade. It's just, you know, something that I have to do every once in a while as part of my marketing and video production business. But um, I'm a, a basic Adobe user, <laughs> a very basic Premiere user. Uh, but, you know, if you have a good idea of who you're, customer is and who who your customers are and what's their person that you craft this persona you can then think what their interests are where would they be where can you go out and find them what kinds of topics are they interested in what would they be googling and you can make sure to have the right content and the right look and the right branding that will attract them specifically and one thing that's very important about that is that you really want to know who your primary target market is as well. So you can have secondary target markets. It's not like you have to only focus on one target market and just like, you know, only do that. But if you know who is your most likely customer to, you're going to talk to them and 99 out of hundred times, you're going to get hired by them. That's the person that you want to be marketing to, because it's just going to have the highest return on investment. And of course, if that overflows into some of your secondary target markets, that's just bonus. So, um, you know, if you create the content for them, you need to have it in different viewing formats. You have to know where they're going to be. So the different viewing formats is if you're marketing to, you know, 65 year old CEOs, you probably don't need to make all your stuff for TikTok. So, uh, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that you bring up a good point. I mean, just, you know, and maybe you're going to get to this in like branding and website, but yeah, like, you know, since a lot of our group are freelance editors, you know, some of us run production companies like myself, you know, it's like, yeah, knowing where to go to engage with these people, you know, it's like, what is the best, you know, is social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, Twitter, you know, and, and again, if you're going to cover that, I'll just shut up now. But, but those are the kind of things I think would be great. And the specific techniques at the in the um, in the social media section, I think I do touch on um, some of the platforms that different like with the demographics for each platform. So um, you know, you can kind of craft your own little strategy on that one. Um, so when it comes to branding and your website, I consider that to be the foundation of your marketing, um, and it's 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 basically everything else is built on this. And some of it can be, you know, a little bit simplistic and a little bit, you know, you can think of it as just like your logos, fonts and colors, like, you know, and that kind of stuff. But there's it's a little bit more than that. Right. Because it's it's your brand identity is also your brand's persona. How you want to present yourself is your brand fun. Is it exciting? Is it serious and informative? Like you want to craft your brand persona based on who you are as a per, as a business owner and then all and what your comp, your uh, company culture is and then where that intersects with your target market and what they would want from you. So, you know, if if um, if I'm doing my 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 film production company and I'm doing go, like going to investors, I'm going to like my Princebury my my film production company website looks a little bit different than my Star Fox Media website. I, I take a lot more liberties and I'm a little bit more fun and playful on my not investment banking website. So, um, your website to me is the salesperson for your business. And so when it comes to digital marketing, a lot of the different uh, marketing funnels and that you set up the goal of those funnels is to try to bring them down to your website. And so in lieu of that, I mean, so basically in lieu of a salesperson, it needs to basically sell them for you. And if it doesn't, then they'll click off and they'll go somewhere else. So you have to kind of think through as like, okay, now that I've gotten them to, to know who I am and search me out, what do I need to tell my customers to get them to then call me and not to just be like, well, that's great, you know, and just, and click off or like, that's cool. Good information, thank you. Um, and so when you set up your funnels, you kind of have to think of it like, okay, where are they gonna go? Where are, gonna, where are they gonna come from? Where are you gonna send them? And then how are you gonna convert them? And how are you gonna move them further down that funnel? And 
the website is usually pretty far down that list. And the further down that list they are, the better, like the more important it is that you can convert. So it may be that last touch before they call you and you get them into your, or they give you their email address on one of your email opt-in forms or something like that, where you can, you're converting them from your marketing funnel into your sales funnel. And then you can actually, you know, reach out to them directly and you know, they're an interested party, which makes it so you're not just, it's not a cold call. It's a, you know, they've already reached out to you. They've, they've given you their email address. They've, they're contacting you. So it's like, you know, they're, they're going to be a higher conversion than someone that you just call out of the blue. Uh, and in this section, I'll also talk about like, you know, how I craft little quick websites for people. Like, it's like, basically here's the core important pieces of a website and, um, and what those look like so that you can make sure that you're at least kind of covering the basics. I recommend that everyone, even if you're a freelancer has your own website so that you can start using that to capture leads and, and, um, and bring in clients. Because I think a lot of you freelancers will know that, you know, you spend a lot of time not doing the thing you're getting paid for and doing the marketing and the administration and things like that. And so the more, tools that you can have that are out there doing your sales for you, the less time you're going to have to spend doing your marketing yourself and the more time you'll be able to spend actually doing work for customers and, you know, making money. So it's a, one of the quickest ways to increase your actual profit margins as a business is to try to automate as much of your marketing process and your administrative process as possible so that you can have these customers coming in without you have, having to actually actively do work. And then you have more time that's freed up to basically, you know, do the thing that you're actually good at, you know, the things that you specialize in. And that's actually one of the reasons we started Star Fox Media is because we wanted to be able to, you know, fill in that piece for people who uh, were specifically with small businesses that they're really good at their role. So like they're, you know, like, for example, a really talented video editor or, um, you know, graphic, um, graphic artist, motion designer, whatever. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're a great marketer, right? So like, you know, we can kind of, we, we started this business to be able to help those kinds of people, um, and, um, kind of do those things that other people aren't necessarily the best at. So, uh, but hopefully by the end of this, you'll know how you'll have a good idea of how to do it yourself. So, um, so when it comes to your brand, you know, the, the, the quickest, the earliest things to think about is again, like, what's your brand's persona? Like who are you as a brand? Um, and how do you want people to see you and to choose your colors, your logo, your fonts and everything like that with that in mind so that, you know, everything is a cohesive picture because consistency is the most important thing to branding. Cause if you're, if you're putting out lots of different types of personas as a brand, what ends up happening is people don't really know who you are. And they don't want to hire people that they don't understand, that they don't know who they are and what they do. So, you know, if, if one if one minute you're fun and playful and, and entertaining and then the next you get super serious, it doesn't feel authentic. And um, so you want to make sure that you're consistent and you, you know, maintain both the unified look and feel, but also personality across all your um, across all your different platforms and all your, your content that you make. So if you have a small team, if you're not like just a, a solo freelancer and you have a small team, you have to make sure that everyone's on board with who you are as a company. I mean, they call it like, you know, just corporate culture or brand, you know, who your what your company culture is. And a lot of time that feels like a buzzword where it's, you know, not that big, like, it, you know, it, it, that just people talk about, but it's not very important. Um, but in this case, it actually is important to this because, you know, knowing who your brand is gives you the ability to be consistent. And so, you know, you can feel authentic. So um, when it comes to your, um, your logo, fonts and colors, it's really important that you have, you know, a good brand guideline sheet, especially if you're, you're working with a team is that everyone knows exactly what colors, exactly what logos to use and what types, all that kind of thing. If you have that all written out, even if it's just you, if you have that written out, having all your color codes in one spot, your hex codes and stuff like that is like, you know, just really convenient. So um, I think actually I do. This is one we just made for a client. Um, I haven't told them that we're sharing this. So, um, but um, we, you know, it's, it's a, a, a golf product that you use to basically strengthen your grip, your grip strength. And so uh, we kind of went with the green and yellow where it's like, you know, the green, we, we didn't want to go right off of the, um, 
the green that is like the, the, the green jacket, you know, from the, from the masters. Um, uh, but you know, we wanted to go with something like a little bit like that field that was on point, but then we needed some colors that, that went well and, and popped off of it that would look good on a shelf because it's a physical product. So, but as you can see, we, we have the hex codes, CMYK, the RGB codes, um, you know, what the different fonts we use um, in different places, all that kind of stuff. So, um, and then of course those photos on the left, the only reason they're important is that, you know, it shows the look and the feel of the brand. So now you know what their look is. And so you can make sure that you're gonna go with that look when you're like, you know, if you're making them a video, you can reference this and try to do your, you know, your color correction or something to kind of match a little bit, you know, and get at least get the same feel. Um, Oh yeah. So the website. Yeah. So here's, here's basically what, what I call the five page website and they don't have to be on five separate pages. I've seen plenty of people do this with um, just one really long page. Like one of those like infinite, like one of those long scrolling websites, not a problem. Um, but these are kind of the things that you want to make sure you cover. And I will explain what each of them kind of, or go into some of them later. Um, but the, the main focus of this website is usually the about us and the services because those are the two where you actually have to write the content um you have to write who you are and then what you do those are you know that's at the end of the day that's what you have to have um the home page for me is a summary of the rest of the website so when someone comes to your website they need to be able to quickly find out who you are and what you do and you know be able to get to your blog and to have, figure out how to contact it contact you all on one page so i think of it as like the the you know table of contents almost for the whole website now contact that one's pretty obvious if you want people to be able to hire you then you need to show them how <laughs> um the blog section is the one that, that usually trips people up because it's like you know why do i want to blog well we will get to that but quickly um it's basically a there's a couple things when it comes to getting ranked in google and having google like you know your website show up when people search for you um and you know it's 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 search engine optimization seo is what it's you know what what kind of goes by in the industry um and the blog is basically your spot to do that so um there's a couple criteria just quickly that google uses um, to rank websites that a blog addresses almost immediately. Um, one is they like to see that you have constantly updating content on your website, that your website's not that hasn't been the same for five years. They don't want to show a website for a company that's been abandoned basically. So, um, the more you, more often you put new content on your website, you know, the more strongly Google is sure that you're still active and that this information is up to date and that you know what you're talking about. And if they go to your contact page and call you, they're not gonna be wasting their time. So um, blogs are basically quickly written, you know, usually that you're using like WordPress or one of those systems or, you know, Squarespace or any of those kinds of things where it makes it really fast to add pages to your website. It's basically all a blog is. Um, and the second one is they really wanna know what your website's about. And so, how does Google know what your website's about? Well, it reads all the words on it. And so um, the more words you have that tell Google what your website's about, the more confidently they'll show it to people that are looking for that kind of thing. So, um, you know, if people are, if, if people are searching for, um, you know, the different kind, like, so for example, as a video marketing production, uh, video production marketing company, if I want someone to find me when they type or they type in video and uh, production and marketing companies in Vista, you know, I want to show up near the top. So I need to make sure that I have lots of articles that talk about video production, marketing, and mention Vista. So, and then, then Google is confident and will show me, you know, to the people that search that. Um, there's a few tools that I use on websites uh, just to make all this a lot quicker. Uh, WordPress, of course, is my, is my website builder of choice. Um, uh, it's just the, it's, it has a little bit higher learning curve than, um, some of the other, um, Squarespace, um, Weebly, some of those guys, but it has the most flexibility. So as someone who actually does websites for a living, having a little bit more options there, they've been around for so long that they have a million plugins and a million templates. And so you can just the, you know, you can find one that exactly matches what you're looking for and install it really quickly and easily. 
Um, whereas the, the other ones will be quick, like there's a lower learning curve to it. You can probably pop up a website in a day without knowing how to do anything, which is so if you're if you're brand, brand new beginner, some of those might be a little bit better for you. But if you have if you've worked with it a little bit, WordPress is, is pretty sweet. Um, Yoast is a specifically WordPress plugin where basically when you're writing a, a blog post, it'll pop up a bunch of criteria on there like, hey, what's your type? What are you trying to get ranked for? What what are you writing this article to be found on Google for? You type that little phrase in there and it's telling you how, how good of a job you, you're doing when it comes to actually, you know, that article, how well that article achieves what you're trying to get searched for. So um, it'll check to make sure that you've used those keywords in the headings a couple times, that you have enough content, that you're using enough images, you're ta putting tags in all your images, just all the things that you should be doing to get, you know, uh, to, to get the most efficient use of, of SEO on your website. So it's just all in one spot, free plugin, pretty sweet. Um, WPMU Dev is a premium plugin, so you do have to pay for this one, but it's a suite of tools, including one that like kind of does what Yoast does, but also does things to make your website faster and to squish your image sizes to where that, you know, they'll load your page faster. Um, share, you know, site maps with Google easily. You know, there's all kinds of things you can do with WPMU Dev. So it's like, you know, kind of more of a premium one that you can add and it does, it takes care of a lot of those different things. And then SEO Quake, if you want to kind of see how your website's doing compared to other websites, or it almost kind of gives you a score, like, you know, how high, how high you rank for different um, search terms on Google, how that's been trending. Um, you can look up your competitors because it doesn't use any back end stuff and kind of see how they are doing and you know what what words they rank for. So you have a competitor you know is doing really well and, and you know beating you up, then you can kind of see what they're doing. And um, I would never say copy them. Hey, hey Jeff, I have a question for you about yeah. SEO. Yeah. So I get so I actually SEO is something that I've been wanting to like find somebody that can help me with SEO for my company website, because, you know, I don't, my website does not rank that high. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm always amazed when people find me based on, you know, on my website, because it's like, you know, it seems like it's the same group of people all the time that are in that top 10, you know, that front page and Google and stuff. And, you know, so are, are there companies out there? I mean, you, you mentioned that you guys do this, but are there, I get emails all the time from places that sound like they're less than legitimate wanting to help me with SEO. And I never engage with them because, you know, I just don't know how trust where they are, but yeah. is that something you all do? Are there companies out there that, that, that people like myself, small businesses can call and say, Hey, here's my website that was built. Cause when I had the website built, I asked the people who the company that built it, and they go, do you guys do SEO? And they said, no, you know, we can kind of set it up for that, but you're on your own with that. You know, you got to, either do it or hire someone to help you with that. And so, you know, is that something that you all do or do you have people that you can help with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say um, SEO usually falls more on the hands of marketing companies than it does on the web design companies themselves. Um, just because a lot of the things you're doing is like, you can't really do SEO until you know who your target market is, what kind of ser uh, terms they're searching um, and what you want to rank for. So, a lot of times a web designer might not want to do the marketing research and the competitive analysis and all those types of things to create the strategy that they will then let you rank for certain terms. So a lot of times it falls on more like marketing companies like us, or um, there are SEO firms, like you said, the ones that like kind of send you those emails, um, which it's a good sign if they're sending you the emails, cause that means they found you, right? So, uh, <laughs> um, which is a great segue because I'm actually the first topic I talk about in the different marketing techniques here, SEO. Um, you're you're muted. I can see in the corner though. Uh, yeah, the space bar isn't supposed to let me. It wasn't working there. Um, so we have one question before you start that. So Jake wants to know what are your feelings re -secu uh, resecurity WordPress versus a managed uh, hosting platform. Security wise, um, for me, I like to have control over like for security, I usually like to have control over as many things as possible. And so 
a managed hosting program, one company kind of manages everything. And so if it's a reputable company and they do a good job, you know, then you're safe. But if it's a company that doesn't take security seriously, then basically you have no control over it. So if security is a thing on your website that you like, you deal with sensitive data, you're dealing with like top, you know, secret stuff, you'd want to make sure that you find a, um, a hosting all in one hosting kind of platform that takes that stuff very seriously. Cause if you don't, you know, then you, you're basically just, you know, you have no control and you're to, um, put your control in the hands of someone who doesn't care. So um, if you're going to use one of those like all in one kind of like hosting web uh, design, you know, all those kinds of things platform, you just got to make sure that you pick one that ha that, that puts a focus on security. Um, the way that we do it is we have, you know, our domain through one brand, we have our hosting through another and we have our, and WordPress does our content. And so there's actually like multiple different places and, and even a, a um, all in one web service is going to have each of those pieces. It's just all in one server. So um, WordPress will have plugins that you can use to, you know, help secure your site. Um, you can find uh, a lot of the hosting platforms on their own will have different kinds of um, things to to secure your site as well. So I personally have been using a lot of different like platforms, you know, all these different platforms with different tools on each of them to basically make sure that each one of them individually is secure. And because I have control over each individual platform myself, I can make sure it is if if it's something I'm worried about. Whereas um, you know, again, they may have a, a blaring gap in their hosting specifically, like their, their servers are not secure. Whereas like, so there's like ways that people can get into your servers directly, or if, um, you know, if maybe there, there's like login breaches and they can not only get into your, your, um, your website storage, but now they can also get into your account to basically turn it like to redirect your website to another website, you know, do things like that. Whereas they, they with one, like one crack, they can get all access to all that. So um, I don't know. There's again, if you pick a all in one hosting platform that is that, that focuses on security and is proud of their security and does a good job at security, like it's going to be secure and you're going to be fine. I mean, for the most part, like there's always, you know, examples of everything getting broken into. So, you know, but as secure as anyone is, I should say. <laughs> uh, so I guess if, if, unless there's another question, I, I'll kind of start on the, the, yep, I, I think we're good. Okay, cool. Um, so when it comes to SEO and blogging, there's, there's three different way types of SEO that you can do. And so when you're first building a website, really the only type of SEO you can do is on-page SEO. And that's basically while you're building it, you're making sure that um, all your heading, like, that all the keywords you want to rank for are in the headings, that your all of your images have um, alt text that also is SEO targeted. Um, you want to make sure that you have enough content on there. Um, but it's, it's basically like, you know, you kind of go through someone's website and kind of up all, update all those things in a day, you know, and that's, and then you're done, but it's not quite as effective as being able to do all three of these. It's only one factor is your on-page SEO. So, um, the next one is off-page SEO and off-page SEO is probably what a lot of those companies are calling you about because what they're trying to get you to do is get other companies to link to your website because Google will look at how many websites reference your website as a sign that you have good quality content and that you are knowledgeable about what, you're, what you do and that other people are looking to you for information. So if someone's Googling stuff about that information, they should show you instead of the person linking to you. So um, getting, they're called backlinks is the, is the industry term for it. Um, a lot of these companies are trying to sell backlinks and there's, good organic healthy ways of getting backlinks and then there's the like it's almost like buying instagram followers where you just pay a bunch of websites to just link to your website and that can work for a short amount of time but google catches on to that pretty quickly so a lot of times what will happen is they'll just you know these same websites are linking to just 
all these websites that pay them. And then, you know, Google finds out and it almost like blacklists the websites that they're linked to. It just like completely gets rid of that. All of the, the, the off page SEO for, for like that, the, that those um, brands are, or that those sites are giving to other people. It's just like, they're not there. And another thing that they added to help with that is not only is it a number of backlinks, but the, there's a domain score and a page score. And your domain score is the general SEO of your whole website domain. And so it'll actually decide the, the if someone gives you a link, it'll look at the domain authority of that website that's linking to you and actually give more credit to ones that have good domain scores. So if like if you're getting a, a link from a university is linking to your website, that link is worth a hundred times more than a little website that someone set up specifically to sell you links. So um, now again, the, the organic ways of doing that is making really good content or working with the university and, and like, you know, doing a podcast with them or something, or, you know, there's really good ways of getting off page SEO and backlinks that is, healthy and is organic and that, you know, Google says good job to, and that's usually making really good content or really good information that people want to see. And then there's the, you know, black hat, which is like, you know, setting up a bunch of website farms that link to your, you know, that you buy backlinks for. So um, there's also just companies that will do the off page stuff organically, like they'll, they'll help you write good content. They'll help you write blogs. They'll help you write articles. Um, they'll reach out to or, like organizations that you, they think there's an overlap with and see if they'll feature your article. Um, they'll set up medium and like all those kinds of different writing pages and make sure they cross post and every post you go goes onto all your social media platforms that those are shareable. Like, you know, those are the things that you can hire people to do that are organic good ways of they're, they're basically just creating good content for you that Google likes anyway. So, um, so there, that's the off page and then there's ongoing. And so ongoing is basically just a combination of on page and off page that you continue to do. So you have, and which to me is blogging basically. So you're creating new content for your website on an ongoing basis that achieves both the on-page SEO of adding more keywords and more information to your website to just make sure Google knows what you're about and make sure that your, your content and your website is updated current, like more, uh, more consistently. And then the off-page stuff is you're making good stuff. People might share it or, you know, link to it or uh, something like that. So, um, Ongoing is basically just the other two, but together and forever. <laughs> how often should you, and maybe you're going to get to this, but like how, what's a good, because like my, so I have a blog on my website and my wife who knows some stuff about this, you know, SEO and web, you know, marketing and stuff like that. She's always on me that I need to be up putting new, if I just added content to the blog, that that would help me, you know, move up the Google, you know, page rankings. But mm -hmm. how, how often should you be posting? I mean, is it like once a week, once a month? I mean, what's a good number, you know, to sort of live by that's, you know, that will help you with that? Uh, I'm, I usually recommend a minimum of once a month. Um, and I think once a week is more like, you know, it once a week will grow you once a month will maintain you is kind of how I look at it. So if you're trying to move up the rankings, you know, and, and like, you know, then you're going to want to make content more than once a month. Uh, maybe twice a month would help would be enough to like slowly move you up the rankings. But um, that's kind of the way I look at it as once a month is kind of my like maintenance mode. Like, like, let's just make sure that, you know, you're not losing places on Google <laughs> and that, you know, you're, you, you might move up slowly with that too. Cause like, it depends on how your competition's doing too. Right. So like if all your competition's not writing blogs, then, and you write once a month, you're doing better than them. So you're going to move up. But um, if you're competition, if you're in a marketing, like uh, an industry like mine, where, uh, you know, doing blogging and marketing and writing articles for people as a living, well, a lot of those companies are pretty good at it and we'll do it once a week or once a day. And so I have a little bit more competition when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, but what's, how long does it normally take to, to start to see the results of moving up? I mean, it, I'm, I'm assuming it isn't like, okay, so I post, I posted, you know, new, you know, new stuff on my blog for three or four weeks straight, you know, should I see something right then? Or is it like, you got to do that for a few months? It's kind of like 
you know, not that I do this, but like lifting weights, you know, you don't go work out at the gym and instantly you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's going to be a process that you have to continue for a certain period of time before you see the results. Yeah, exactly. And so that, that's exactly it is it's, it's one of those things that kind of builds over time. And it's almost like one of those, um, self-feeding cycles too. Cause like, as you get more content out there and you get more views, then more people will look at it. And if more people look at it, more people might share it. And if more people share it, that gets you more views. And so it's like, as you, and then you make more content and that, and so you already have more views and you have more content. So they all, you have more eyes on that content. So then more people will share it, which gets you more views. So it's like, it does have a little bit of a, of like that kind of exponential curve, which is a lot like, I would say weightlifting a little bit is like, you don't necessarily see results quickly um, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're buff. And so, you know, it's like you keep on it for, you just consistently did it for a year and like, you don't notice the growth until all of a sudden one day you see the big difference. And so, um, I think that's actually probably a pretty good analogy is like, you know, it, it's, it does take, a, uh, take some time and the quicker, the more often you post, the more often you do these things, the quicker it works. So <laughs> if you're only posting once a month or like, you know, once every other week or something like that, it's going to take a little longer to see the results than if you're doing it every day or every week or, you know, something crazy, but uh, every day would be kind of nuts. That'd be a lot of writing, but. Um, Good question. Uh, I was going to ask. Um, so I use like, I, I'm not going to be the person that writes blogs just because that's just not my jam, but I do have a system. My website's through like a, a web flow. And have a thing that just kind of throws my Instagram up there too, that like mirrors my Instagram. Does that count since it's like always changing and always, or is it, or since it's linking from offsite, is it not? It wouldn't do much. Okay. Um, it might see a little bit of change on there, but the 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 chunk of code that pulls that from Instagram um, probably remains the same. It's like you you know the code like is an API that pulls from blah 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 you know like that kind of thing. So. Um, it would probably do more than zero because it's going to see a couple new photos on there or something like links. Like it's going to, um, when Google sees it as text, it'll see the the photo as a different URL or something. So we'll see new links there. Um, so it's better than nothing. <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate you sugarcoating that for me. <laughs> and I, and I, there are a couple ways like in these tools and there's some other things you can do to kind of help you with this writing process too. So um, if you're not much of a writer, um, you know, you might be a video person. <laughs> Nobody in this group fits that criteria. Come on. <laughs> um, so a lot of people what we're doing is we're either writing blog posts to turn into videos or we're taking videos and turning them into blog posts. So um, some of these tools down here, I've listed these three in particular aren't necessarily specifically for doing what I'm talking about. But so, so I'll quickly go over these, you know, I'll quickly go over the ones that, that you could use to, um, to make some blogs out of videos, which is, you know, you could, there's, oh, I can't remember the, is it Descript that you can pull captions, but you can basically have the, the video to pull the, the audio and turn it into, um, captions. Um, uh, well, Premiere does that now. Premiere will do it. Yeah. You know, that's a feature that I recently found um, and was very happy with. It actually did a pretty good job too, which I was, I expected it to suck um, because I had never used it. And if you don't use something, you expect it not to just like blow your mind. Um, but I actually used it for a video, like was it, like a month ago. And I just like pulled it up and, and like had it generate a, um, like generate the, the transcript for me. And I looked, I was like, oh, there's like five words missing in the entire like five minute video. Like that's pretty good. And then I had it generate into captions and it like, it was deep. I had to probably move a couple little end point in points out points out like and change a couple words, but it was like, it was solid. Like that was actually pretty good. Yeah. For, for free and included with the, it, it's amazing how accurate and well it works. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I was blown away by it. Like this is free. I don't have to pay for this. Sweet. And Descript, I think you have to pay for. So, and since you're all users of this already included, you know, you already have this software that has this included, that might be a great way of doing it is if you're willing to more make like a vlog, you know, more of like some video content that you can use to uh, about different subjects that you want to make some YouTube videos or something, 
then you take those videos, you put them up, in, you know, while you're editing them, you have it pull out a transcript and you turn that into the blog post, put the video at the top. And now you have the, the a video with basically the transcript below it. You can edit it if you want, or you can toss it into my first tool here called Jarvis. And Jarvis is an artificial intelligence writing program. And so you can do as little as give it a subject and a couple of bullet points and it'll write a blog for you. And it's okay. It's totally okay. Like it's impressively okay. Um, so I, I actually had a, a Masters of Creative Writing was doing our blogging for a while. And so um, we ended up having a couple blog posts that we would, we would when we were first, we first got Jarvis, we're like, let's, let's see if this actually writes okay, right? So we made a couple test posts and we gave it to our, our you know, English professor, Masters of Creative Writing, um, you know, blog writer and said like, you know, what would you grade this as like, a, as a, a teacher? She's like, it, it actually writes a lot like a high school or a college student where it says a lot of nothing. So, um, so if you have a hard time taking some, a couple really good, important points and filling in, in between them, it actually works pretty well. <laughs> um, and it also is good at rewriting things. So for example, if you did this video and you pulled out this transcript, you could have Jarvis rewrite your transcript just in different language. And then it would basically be a blog post for you. So Cool. Could be a cool tool to basically make it so you guys could write your own con your blog posts without being a, you know, wanting to be an article writer, a blogger. So um, I already went over Yoast um, quickly before. It's basically you take those blog posts that you're writing, it checks them for SEO quality and make sure you're doing a good, like your posts are actually going to have the effect you want them to have. Because um, why make a blog post and spend the time doing all this content creation if it's not going to help you rank higher in Google anyway. So um, one thing that's important, um, when it comes to SEO is that just because you, you don't want to write just for Google, you do want to write for people as well. And you want your blog, your articles that you write to be good, like high quality. And so, and for people to actually want to read them. So, um, I just realized it's already seven 30. Um, what, what is your guys' normal end time? We're, we're good. So we we're scheduled till eight 30. So, oh. um, so yeah, so you're good. Okay, cool. I'm on 17 out of how many? I don't remember, but um, it's the last uh, third. So, <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Um, so the next thing we have on our on our different digital marketing techniques is email marketing. And the reason I put this next is because a lot of times when you get your your goal is to get people to your website, the next step is to get them to either contact you directly or give you their email address or phone number or some kind of contact information for them so that you can reach out to them and put them into your sales funnel instead of your marketing funnel. Because if the marketing funnel is to generate leads, your sales funnel is to convert them into customers. So um, email marketing is a really good way of doing that. It's basically a way to keep reaching out to people who have already come to your website or you've met in real life and they've given you their email. That means that they like at least kind of like you and think you're kind of smart. So you can reach out to them and, you know, maybe remind them that you are a video editor and that if they're ever looking for video editing, you provide those services. So um, you can tell them about upcoming the promotions you have if you're doing more customer facing stuff. Cut promotions probably don't work as well for, uh, for business to business service kind of stuff. But, you know, maybe like, hey, I, my, my, my calendar is looking pretty empty right now. I'm willing to work for you for a little bit uh, cheaper right now. So if you want a good deal. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, so email marketing can be used for a lot of different things. Um, but the, the most important thing is that it should be one piece of a, of a strategy and not the only piece because email marketing is, if you just like, if you're like me, you pretty much just delete all the emails almost immediately, unless you're cons, but if I am looking for something, a service in that specific industry at that time, when I get that email and it's not a company that I'm pissed at because they're sending me stuff all the time, it's like you're spamming me. And like, you know, it's, it's a company that I asked to contact me already. Then, you know, that's when I do read through it. And if they have promotions going on, it can create the sense of urgency to get people to purchase right away. And so um, a lot of times in marketing, or a specific, I guess it's more in, in sales, the idea is to create a sense of urgency so that people don't think like, oh, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Like, you know, because people think about things forever and they never actually act. So 
you want to basically give them a reason to do it now and not tomorrow or the next day or next week or next month or next year or never. So um, that being said, a lot of people also will, will buy mailing lists. And so they just have a bunch of emails um, kind of like these other things I've talked about. It will kind of work, but at the same time, it's not nearly as effective. You won't get the same open rates, the same click through rates and all the, and you know, the same effectiveness as you would if it was an organically built list of people that actually like what you do. So um, those are ways that you can do that, but you know, so for tools for this one, um, I have just constant contact HubSpot and MailChimp. There are three email automation programs where, you know, basically you type, you have an email list in there, you write an email, you hit send and it sends it to your whole mailing list. So you can segment your lists into like, these are, um, specifically producers. These are specifically marketing departments at corporations. You know, you can kind of do that kind of thing so that you can make sure to send emails targeted to the right people, to the different segments, things like that, which makes your emails more effective if you're sending relevant information. Because if you send people not relevant information enough times, they'll unsubscribe from your, your newsletter and then you wasted your time. So, um, does anyone have any questions about email marketing before? I guess I should ask, I should do that. I should ask if people have questions about things in between subjects so I don't get too far along. It's people usually chime in if they have questions. So yeah, don't worry about that. Cool, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, for so I don't actually have my chat up right now. Because yeah, DJ and I monitor that. Cool. I full screen my presentation, so. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll let you know if there's any. Wait. Uh, so this is kind of the one that I think most people have the most questions about usually, which is social media. Um, a lot of our clients will come to us and just say, I need help with social media. And it's like, okay, do you have a full marketing strategy and you have everything else covered and you're just like, or is this your only thing that you think you need to do? Cause like, you know, it's not, but, um, social media is, is something that a lot of people feel, I mean, cause it, it's something that a lot of people interact with on a daily basis as a consumer. So, you know, it's 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 people will think that they can do it themselves and they'll also think that there's no way that they can do it themselves and i so all the way across the board on that one <laughs> um but the big thing that social media does is it, it it gives your your potential customers and you a way to interact directly and um it's kind of like halfway between that outgoing and ingoing marketing is it's it can be the first touch point for a lot of different potential customers so uh, a lot of times you know, you want to create content that's for people that are a little bit higher up on that, that, um, that marketing funnel that, you know, maybe they don't quite know that they want to hire you yet. They're not quite sure that they even want to hire anybody yet at that point. So, you know, a lot of times I'm making content for businesses. Well, I'll do things like, you know, like for example, teach people how to do marketing, you know, <laughs> and a lot of times they, while doing that, they learn that some of the stuff is actually really complicated and there's a lot of thought that goes behind it. And, when they find that out, sometimes they find out they don't want to do it themselves. And then of course they're going to contact moi, the person who gave them this wonderful information. So um, I'm almost kind of doing an example of, you know, one of the marketing techniques you use for in inbound marketing, which is you create, you try to teach people things that shows them, you know, what you're talking about and you get them to like you. And hopefully you all really like me. So um, it's important to have like, you know, presence on the social media platforms that your audience is on. It's not important to have social media presence on platforms that your audience is not on. So my example at the beginning, 65 year old CEOs is your target market and you're making all your content for TikTok. You're a hardcore TikToker, TikTokian, and um, you're, you're, you know, you got 2 million followers on there. I don't know how well that's going to actually translate to business. And so, um, you know, your thousand LinkedIn followers might actually be more important than your 2 million uh, TikTokers. So um, that's why having a great understanding of your target market and their, their habits, where they actually consume information is so important because you can be barking up the wrong tree. And, um, and since a lot of the people are here are freelancers and I'm pretty sure they're going to be business to business. And one of the main criteria they're targeting is probably job roles places. I would say LinkedIn's probably a good one for most of you. Um, right off the top of the head, right off the top of my head. Um, Facebook, 
you know, probably is going to hit the right ages and demographics um, when it comes to, I'll, I'll, I'll cover that stuff on the next slide. I think I have a little chart um, of all the different demographics and where the, and where they actually, uh, for each of the, the social media platforms. But um, when it comes to tools, you know, the Adobe Suite, I'm sure that some of you have used that before. Um, we use that for a lot of the photo stuff with Photoshop and Illustrator, making graphics and things like that. Uh, but also, of course, we do a lot of video work. And so, of course, we use Premiere. Uh, <laughs> on the, the one step before that, we have Canva. Um, Canva is almost like the iMovie to Premiere. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a, it's, well, I don't even want to say that. Like, that's kind of not fair. It is very good at doing very specific things. It gives you not nearly as many of options as Photoshop or Illustrator does, but it has a bunch of really great templates. It has things where if you're not a graphic designer, you can pop up a template, change the words to match your business, change the picture out to be of what, you know, something relevant and you have a pretty good, you know, post or flyer or something like that. So it's very simple. You can't do everything you want to do. If you're a, a graphic designer and you pop up Canva, you'll probably like eventually you'll get frustrated and you'll probably open up Illustrator again. But um, until then, it's it's really good for people who do not want to get deep into the graphic design kind of stuff. Um, and of course, PowerPoint, which is um, I would say one step removed even from Canva. I mean, if you're making flyers and social media posts and PowerPoint, you're probably not doing it right, but it's better than nothing. Just make something, please. <laughs> um, and then, so for delivery, there's these four are po um, post scheduling tools. So basically we use later currently, we used to use Sendable, but um, basically you can create a social media post, put it on a calendar, write the text, put your image in there. And when it comes to that time, it'll automatically post it across all your social media platforms. So um, if you guys are seeing, uh, having a hard time, like keeping on a schedule and making sure you're consistently posting or you're like, you know, I work a lot, man. Like I can't just be sitting on my social media accounts all day. That's fair, neither can we. And we do social media for a living. So we have specific days where we'll write up a couple weeks of posts, schedule them out, make sure that they're, you know, and we'll be able to strategically do so, right? It's like, I want them to have two sales oriented posts. I want to have two this kind of posts. And then you can, so you have it all on a calendar. So it makes it a lot easier to like, kind of like strategically put posts out when you want to have them. And um, so that's kind of, that's kind of useful. Uh, and all four of these kind of do the same thing. Um, later is our current one of choice. It's a kind of a good mix of really good UI, um, good functionality. It works consistently and it's not too expensive. Uh, Sendable had a couple more features that was really good for marketing companies like ours, where you could like send posts for approval to clients, have different clients all in it. They, you could send it and it goes to the right client. They can say yes or no to the post and it won't post until they say yes, things like that. Um, but it seems to not work that well. So, and if they never saw the post, it just never posts it. It just sits in their email forever. So that came, that, there was a couple issues created with that, that I won't talk about. Um, and then Hootsuite is a great option if you're, cause it's free for up to three accounts and up to like, I want to say like 30 posts a month or something. So like, if you're not doing high, um, High, high amounts of posts, you know, have a million platforms, it's, it can be free, which is kind of sweet. Um, and Sprout Social is the most intense in-depth platform, but it's pretty expensive, uh, but it has really good analytics and things like that to see how you're kind of doing compared to, you know, and that you're actually getting a good return kind of on your marketing, your social media um, stuff. So, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. So, this is a chart I stole from someone. Um, it's from a place called Marketing Charts. Um, but the data is from Pew Research Center, which makes it awesome. Um, so this kind of lists all the different platforms and um, what, you know, who's on what. So um, you can see, do, I have a, do you guys see my pointer? Yep. Sweet. Um, so you can see like TikTok, oh, 48% ages 18 to 29. How about our 65 year old CEOs? 4%. No. So, you know, like that's, that's why these kinds of things are very important to, to know. Um, but some things like, 
you know, if your target is 65 plus, you're going to have a hard time reaching them on digital platforms, like kind of period. Um, so, you know, if, if that, when we do have tar- uh, clients with that as their target market, we have a retirement center um, a lot as one of our clients. A lot of times, I mean, we'll target their, I mean, we'll, that, this is a different, I guess that's not a very good example because sometimes we'll just target their kids, right? You know, the, the parents of, or the, the children of um, nursing home aged parents, you know, because it's like a lot of times they're living with the kids and the kids don't necessarily want to deal with that anymore. So put grandma on a home. But uh, <laughs> that was a really rude way of saying that. I'm just, I'm just trying to play around. Um, the using something like this is great for kind of seeing like, you know, you, you build that customer per- persona, you can see them in your mind, you know who they are. Um, a lot of times in my, I, I'll be like, Hey, do you have any customers that just were super wowed with what you did and they just loved you and you want to have a bunch of customers exactly like them? Hey, that's your, your ideal customer. So, uh, you can kind of use that as an example. If you don't want to do a bunch of marketing research, it's a good starting point at least. Um, but in marketing, I guess I, I'll get to this at the end, I guess. So I'll, I'll just leave that one there, but, um, you know, this was pulled off of Google. So if you need to find it again, you can probably find it. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. And this is why. So this is what I was going to say and interrupted myself until, cause I was like, you know what, we're going to get to this in the analytics and tracking section. Um, marketing is like a science experiment and it's somewhere, it's like halfway between an art and a science, right? It's kind of almost, I mean, honestly, for like video editing is a little bit of art and science too, but, um, Marketing is a lot like in between, halfway between the, um, art and the science. And because a lot of times you're, tra- you, you're creating hypotheses, right? So it's like, I think my target market is this. I think they are here. I think that they will like a post like this. You make these hypotheses and if you never test them or, or see if that's true, you'll, you, you know, you're, you're guaranteed to be wrong on some of these things. Um, so a good marketer like myself is really impressed by analytics. And so what we like to do is we test everything. So we create your customer persona. We decide, we, you know, we have a good idea of where they like to be. Um, but, you know, specifically people in your industry might not fit the demographics compared to everyone else. I bet if you're 65 ish and you do video editing, you're a little more tech savvy than the rest of the 65 year olds since you're working on computers all day and you're probably on social media on these platforms, you're probably in that 50% on Facebook uh, and on Instagram and stuff like that. Why? Because you're on computers all day and you know how to use them. So um, not that people don't know how to use computers of these days. That's, that's kind of stupid, but you know what I mean? You're better. You spend more time on them. Uh, so, you know, that, that can be a hypothesis that you have, but then you got to test it and you might be wrong. So you, what you do is you look at your analytics and you see like, you know, what kind of people are looking at my posts? Um, who is this having the biggest impact on? Um, you can also see like, hey, I made this post thinking that, you know, it and posting it on Facebook and I posted on Instagram as well, just like, you know, for shits and giggles and the Instagram per- post performed better somehow. And it's like, hey, I didn't think that was my target market. So you can learn more about your target market through testing your hypothesis. And so, to do that, you need to have analytics set up and, and you have to be checking your analytics and seeing how you're doing. And so for clients, what I'll do is I'll make sure to set up one analytics meeting a month where we just kind of go through everything. We see, did your numbers go up? Did your numbers go down? Who's kind of looking at your posts? Which ones did the best? Which ones did the worst? Um, why did the ones that do, why did these ones do bad? Like posts are going to do overperform and posts are going to underperform. And that's not a problem. The problem is if you don't learn from it and you don't like keep doing better from it. So, you know, at that point you need to make sure that, you know, if this post didn't do well, we'll create another hypothesis, right? You've tested, you've created a hypothesis, you tested it, you got, you analyzed the results. That's a scientific method. And you found out that you're, that you were incorrect on your hypothesis. So you reformulate your hypothesis and you try it again. And so that's marketing. It's great. Um, so, Um, marketers do this, these experiments with a thing called AB testing a lot. Um, a lot of ad platforms specifically will do this where you can create two ads and you'll just change one variable. Like I'm going to make the button blue. And then you see the one with the blue button got 10 times the clicks, you know, the, um, click through rate as the one with the green button. From then on, you should probably make blue buttons. 
you know, things like that, or you'll change the headline or you'll change the, the, which video, you know, you may, maybe make two edits of the video and you decide what you see, you can test which one does better, which one performs better. And you could have thought that this one would, that you should do it this way because that's your target market, but you know, you can be wrong. I'm wrong sometimes, not, not often, but sometimes. Um, and then, so some tools do that. Google analytics is kind of our big one um, because it tracks your website, which is usually that, again, that bottom of the funnel where you can see how many people click when people click your social media posts, they go to your website. Now, what do they do, right? Um, do they click around? Do they get your website and it took too long to load? So they've left instantly, um, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, Facebook business manager has really good analytics and they've combined with Instagram. So now you can look at your Facebook and your Instagram analytics in the same spot, which is kind of cool. Um, LinkedIn campaign manager is, you know, I make a lot of LinkedIn posts these days, I mean, not posts, ads and po I guess posts for clients, um, make a lot of LinkedIn posts for clients and advertisements on LinkedIn. And so it's the main place to see how your ads do, and, you know, set up ads. Um, and then there is HubSpot, which is, I mean, I guess it's more of like, I, I use that for the, um, email marketing specifically, but whatever email marketing program that should just say email marketing program because whatever one you use, that's just one we use. So um, whichever one you use, if you use constant contact or you use uh, MailChimp or any of those guys, they're, they're all good. So um, we, we do have a question. Um, you muted again. I heard why is my, there, my space bar doesn't seem to be as, uh, as functional as it should be. Yeah. Um, we have a question. Uh, happened again. There we go. Okay. Now we have a question from the, the third time's the charm. Yes. We have a question from the Facebook feed. Jane uh, Hare wants to know, and I think this is from a few minutes ago, what you were talking about. Do you have a recommendation for basic training on any of the delivery platforms? A lot of the delivery platforms will have um, some pretty good tutorials built. Um, and the, like the millennial I am, I look everything up on YouTube too. Um, so, uh, Specifically for later, I believe they did have some videos built. Um, HubSpot is also, if you're, I mean, if you're not caring about the platform, but you're learning more about the techniques, HubSpot's marketing classes are some of the best and like best on the market. Like I got a marketing degree and then I learned more on my HubSpot training than I did for my school. So um, it was it talked about inbound marketing. It talked about, you know, things like, um, like basically the whole marketing strategy kind of scene was it, it got a little bit more into the weeds of like, how do you actually do marketing? Right. Cause like my marketing, um, this is a rant, but my marketing major kind of thing, they prepared you to like go be a, you know, VP of marketing or like chief marketing officer for a corporation and one multi-million dollar budgets. And it's like, that's just not your, your standard first entry level marketing job. So, um, you know, probably should have had let that more for like the masters of account, uh, masters of marketing kind of level. But, you know, here we are, me knowing how to allocate million, multi-million dollar marketing budgets, which will be very useful to all of you in this group. So, um, but yeah, a lot of those platforms individually will have their own um, tutorials and things like how to use them. I did, I used that for later every once in a while. I looked up how to, um, how to create subgroups when I first switched over it to like, so I could create like different spaces for each of my clients so that they wouldn't have to see each other's posts because that would be stupid and really, and it would actually be kind of against people's privacy. I feel like, like I shouldn't have one client see the other client's work. That's weird. Um, so things like that were great. And then when I was actually choosing one, I actually looked at a bunch of YouTube tutorials of each one to kind of see like how they worked, showed, you know, people using them and analyzing them and reviewing them and saying which ones they liked. So um, that's kind of, I would recommend going to the website directly if you already have one picked, um, seeing if they have good stuff. And if they don't go to YouTube because YouTube has everything. <laughs> I think that uh, Jane, you can let me know if that doesn't answer your question. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thanks. So, and it looks like I don't have my next slide usually, which isn't here is one on advertising because advertising is usually an outbound marketing thing. Um, but when in digital marketing, I like to use advertising as a way to just expedite and boost what you're already doing for inbound marketing. So um, 
most of our clients, what I recommend they do is have small advertising budgets at first and use that budget to test the, your, your different marketing techniques out. So I'll usually have a client come in and I'll just be like, Hey, can you just like toss on a $300 a month advertising budget here? And we're going to toss that. We're going to put that on all your platforms that we use for you. We're going to spread it out. We're going to see where you're getting return on investment. And it's really hard to kind of test the effectiveness of your, of your funnels if people aren't going through them. So um, we'll put the, get people into your funnel through all these different platforms, see how these different things are, are performing. Um, and I mean, if you already have really good funnels, like, you know, that, you know, 50% of the people that come to your website, give you a call. It's like, okay, cool. Like your website's solid. Like we don't need to like edit that when it comes to the sales funnel. But when you're doing all these analytic things, you can see the, where the weak links in your marketing funnels are. So you're making posts and no one's seeing them. Well, you know, that can kind of be solved with ad budget, but maybe you're just sharing them in the wrong place. You know, um, people are seeing your posts, but no one's interacting with them and no one's going to your website from there. Well, maybe you're not making the best content or you're making the wrong kind of content or you're making it for the wrong people. Um, if people are like seeing your content, going to your website, but then they don't put in their email address or call you, well, then maybe you need to have a better sales pitch on your website, but you can use these analytics to kind of go through your different funnel, your steps. I made this post. I want it to send them to this blog post from this blog post. I want them to type in their email address here. And with that, I'm going to reach out with this marketing email and, um, and send them a promotion. And with that promotion, I'm hoping they're going to call me. Like that's your funnel that you set up. You can look at your conversion rates on each one of those things. I had this many people see my post. These many people went to the blog. These many people put in their email address. These many people um, called me. And you can kind of see where you have those lowest percentages, like where you have the biggest drop-offs. And, you know, and if you if you have, if you set up some funnels and they become super effective, like where you're getting a lot of, like everyone who comes in this funnel hires you, that's when you start putting a bunch of ad budget towards that, that, um, that funnel to basically feed more people into it. So we usually recommend having small ad budgets just to kind of get started and to test these funnels. But if you find one that for every ad dollar of advertising you put in, you bring a hundred in sales, like, you know, put more money into it, <laughs> like, you know, and, and until you can't take any more clients, right? Like in, if, if you're already booked up fully, then don't put any more money into it. That's stupid. But you know, like if, if you want more clients, like, put more money into that, into a, into effective funnels. But that's why I try to follow up analytics with advertising, because after you do analytics and you've set up your website for success, you have these social media posts that are effective. You have email marketing that works. Then you can put advertising dollars behind it to then just get more people in the top of that funnel. And which will, you know, if it has a good conversion rate, will turn into more money and you won't just be throwing money away. So I think that's, pretty much it we we do have a question for you uh from kirk he wants to know i've heard that posting videos on youtube may actually help your website regarding ranking in part due to the fact that youtube is owned by google and google likes to keep their users within their products do you think it will help significantly um i would say yeah um so google okay so it's a little bit of a complicated question because like having an embedded YouTube video in your website doesn't necessarily do the direct on page SEO that you would hope it would do. However, when someone goes to your website and clicks that video, you know, not only have you given them good content and of course underneath that video, you can have the written, like, you know, what that's, what it says in the video, which you can then use for like, you know, keywords for, you know, SEO that way. Um, you're also, creating content that if people are looking at it and sharing it, then basically you're, you're, you're boosting your YouTube channel and YouTube does kind of take in your online presence of your brand and all the different places you're being mentioned into consideration when it ranks you. So if you have a viral YouTube video, you're probably going to pop up higher on Google just because there's more people linking to your website. It's generating more traffic that goes to your website, which is more tra like another thing that Google uses to see how many people to send your website is how many people go to your website. I know that's stupid, but they do that. Like if you have a really popular website, Google's like, oh, a lot of people are already like trying to go to this website. Like, you know, we should probably send more people there. Like people like it. And so 
how long people stay on your website. If you have a good video on your website and they're they're so they're staying on your website for multiple minutes, that's another criteria that that Google really likes to see. So like it will see that there's a, a YouTube video embedded into this thing and it will know what, what, what YouTube that video, what YouTube video that is because it's hosted on their service and it'll see how popular that video is. So in a roundabout way, yes, it will absolutely help you with your, and that's why we do that. Whenever we do uh, videos for people, you can just embed it right in the website manually, but there's a couple reasons why we actually usually upload it to YouTube and then just put um, the YouTube embed into the website. Number one, because it's hosted off site, doesn't take up space on your server. Uh, number two, it's great for SEO. And then number three, a lot of times you want to build your YouTube channel. It's one of your social media platforms. And, and if you remember going to this guy, YouTube's pretty sweet. Like it's the most frequented platform out of all of these almost consistently. So YouTube's pretty sweet. And so if you guys as video editors have any like you know have any kind of relation to trying to get more people to make videos and you know you can just happen to make them for people like you know sounds like a good crossover and maybe that's a good point you can use that as a sales technique because like hey youtube's great and it is the number one platform for demographics for pretty much everything so if you want people to see your content you need to make youtube videos and guess what i can help you make them no, so. <laughs> well I, actually that uh, to, to get back to the youtube question that was something that i had been told and, and and i actually have two questions real quick so one is i so like on my company website if you go there all of the videos to click on like in the work section you know that they're there those are all hosted on vimeo because you know, Vimeo's got better quality, you have more control over the player and things like that. But I was told that when I do a blog post that I should use, I should post both on Vimeo and YouTube and that any blog post should have the YouTube embed or YouTube link for exactly what you said, because the blog is where most likely people are gonna find you just because of all the SEO stuff. And so that will help with what you talked about. So you, the blog should all be, you know, YouTube stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so com quick comment on that. And then the other question I have is too, you talked about creating content and like, you know, for your blog posts and doing a possible video and then using the, the transcripts or transcripts. Are you, are you saying like, if I were to create a, a vlog, let's say about, you know, something for my clients, like, you know, something they should know when they're hiring a production company, mm -hmm. you know, is, so what you're saying is I should create the video and let's just say it's me talking on camera. And then underneath that would just be the transcript of everything that I'm saying. So they can either watch the video or read it, you know, but it's the same content in both places. Is that what you're saying? I would recommend changing it up a little bit. So that's kind of why I was mentioning like Jarvis and some of those programs is you can just list the transcript. Um, but a lot of times, I mean, Google's smart and they can see like, you know, kind of know what's in the video and see the transcript and they're not get, like it. They know it's not quite a, like the original new brand new content. Whereas if you're right at, you're filling out the sections a little bit more, you're adding images to it or something or examples or um, rewriting the sections just in different words and things like that. Like, you know, it, it creates more value and more reason for people to have watched the video and then read. So they're going to stay on your website longer. So if you have the ability and the time and the energy to do so, I'd recommend taking the videos, taking the transcript and just kind of like either like rewriting it a little bit or filling in, adding a little bit more, like add a customer story, add like an example, add a video, add, I mean, add a picture, add like, you know, that kind of stuff, link to stuff, links. Oh, links are great. Like Google loves to see you linking both within your website. So if you have another blog post, like on your website about a, a similar subject, right in that blog link to that other blog post where it's like, you know, if you want to learn more about this, you can read this blog post. And so you, you'll, you'll, it keeps people on your website longer. They're learning more. They're being able to quickly navigate between your information. So it's, it's a win, 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 win to do that. So um, having the, the written content's great for, for just SEO because it's like, it's really easy, easily readable by Google's like, you know, they call them spiders, but they go through your website. Um, and then you can put those specific keywords and headings and all those specific places. And then also you can link between your different blog posts and to, you can link to outside pages too. That's not actually a bad thing. If you found good resources places and you link to them, like, you know, it, it helps you too, a little bit, not as much as it helps them, but it helps you too. So, yeah. 
One one other question that I have, and if anybody else has questions, feel free, feel free to to post them up in the pot or the chat pot pod. I can't talk anymore; it's late and I'm tired. Just do chat pod, or uh, you know, put it up in the Facebook if you're watching on Facebook. Um, but one question I had, and, and this might be a little weird, but it relates back to to editing stuff. So I get a lot of calls now from clients, and they want to create video. They want to create their video commercial, whatever. And then they want to do social media spots. You mm -hmm. know, they want to do a 30, a 15 for Instagram, for things like that. Are there things that that editors, you know, and the post-production people need to know or, or production companies that need to know to sort of help the clients who, who aren't working maybe with a marketing firm like yourself to, to create content that's that's tailor-made for those platforms? Um, or, or just if, if we know that this is going to live in a social media kind of world, what do we need to know when we're creating the video to help that, you know, get more noticed, I guess. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, there's a couple things that you can do. I mean, if you have any control over the type of content they're creating, um, I love making series like video series, because like, again, it's really easily replicatable. Um, and especially if you're doing things like um, you're making blog posts and videos, like five tips on blah, 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 you know, the top five reasons you should blah, blah, blah. Those are great kind of videos and posts to make because you can literally take each po each tip individually and turn it into a YouTube video easily. Like, you know, that's a very easy, like thing to extract where some things it's like, you know, it's a little bit more amorphous. If you take out a little 15 second bit, it's like hard to teach something, someone something in 15 seconds. Well, if it's like a little tip, you can kind of do that a little bit. So um, those kind if you have any control over what kind of content they make, like you can recommend those kinds of things. If you don't, um, I like to, ex I mean, it, it's all about storytelling, right? So how do you tell a story in 15 seconds? How do you tell a story in a minute? And so right off the bat, you need to be able to grab people's attention. Like what's the hook? What's the attention grabber? So, um, you know, say something outrageous, say something silly, say something funny, like, you know, do something that grabs their attention, say what you need to say, call the action. You know, that's kind of the, the, um, the the script for you know that's the three act structure for the for marketing videos is you know you grab their attention tell them the information you need to tell them and then tell them what to do with that information so <laughs> okay um let's see any any other questions i'm trying to because i have like i could just keep going just because i have like a million questions about all this kind of stuff but i don't want to hog it all so if anybody else has any questions but and um don't yeah, I do have questions. They're fun. That's yeah. <laughs> Q and A is the th like honestly. If I could only do the Q and A section, that'd be so much better for me. Like, well, it's you know, it, it's this is one of those topics that I think you know, it's it's something that we all need to know, and because we're all we're all in business for ourselves in one way or another. I mean, you kind of talked about it at the beginning. Is that you know we all have websites to promote ourselves and and getting the word out, whether you run a small production company or a big production company, or you're just a one person, you know, you know, freelancer or whatever. It's like, you got to get the word out. You got to, and, and knowing all this stuff now, it's, you know, it's, it's not just a matter of having a website and then thinking everybody's going to start showing up and you're, you know, beating down your doors to, to get work. You know, there's more work that needs to be done. And, and I think that all the stuff you talked about tonight is, is so helpful. I mean, I have learned a ton and I'm probably going to be watching this meeting again and maybe calling you, um, you know, because yeah, it's, you know, this is stuff we need to know. If you want to grow your business, if you want to get more work, these are the things that you have to have to do. And you have to think about that both from a growing your own business, but also helping your clients grow theirs and creating the content for them. Cause you know, I mean, yeah, I have a lot of small businesses that call me and, and, you know, they ask me for marketing advice. I'm like, look, I create the videos beyond that, you need to hire a marketing firm. Yeah. You know, and I can give them little bits of information, but I'm going to refer them to people like you. It's also very important that when like, you know, you're making, say you're doing your own marketing, right? Yeah. I mean, cause as a freelancer or even a small business owner is like, you know, you're not only the CEO, you're not only the, you know, doing the work, you're the, you know, chief marketing officer, the chief finance officer, you're all these different things. So the, the more efficient you can be at doing each of those different roles that you're assigned, you know, the more you can spend with your clients and actually, you know, turning a profit. So when it comes to marketing, 
if you can do it efficiently and you're not just like, cause again, you, you can do marketing and not have any results. And because you're, you're, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree, you don't have your target market, right. You don't, you know, you're not doing the strategy piece. If you have the strategy, right. You can do half the work with twice the results. Right. So that's why it's important to know these kinds of more marketing strategy pieces as a freelancer and as a small business owner, because you don't want to do more work and get less results. You know, at the end of the day, like you want to do it. Like I am all about efficiency. If, <laughs> if I can do the same, get the same results with half the work, why would I do more work? Like, you know, and so I think everyone needs to be like that as a business owner. Like that's just, you know, I, just, I run this, like I own Star Fox Media. I have to bring in our own clients. I have to make sure to do all that stuff. I finally have a big enough team where I'm not actually doing a lot of the the actual client work myself anymore. Like I have, an, I have a videographer and an editor on the team. I have a social media manager. I have a graphic designer. I have a project manager. Like, you know, so I'm like, you know, my team's growing pretty, like I'm only a year and a half old. So, you know, I don't have to do a lot of that stuff anymore. So now this is my job. No. <laughs> no. Um, one question that we uh, got, we've got here from Jane. She wants to know, I'm interested in this topic for my business, but also for a small nonprofit. How should I think about the nonprofit differently? Yes. Nonprofits are awesome. So there's a couple nonprofits that we work with and the only thing that's really different about a nonprofit when it comes to marketing is a lot of times a nonprofit's goal or like product that they make is information or like, you know, especially if you're like one of those, like where it's like awareness, something awareness, your product half the time is information. So your product is marketing. So, you know, which is kind of a weird way to think about it, but it's like, you're trying to get a message out as your, your, the role of your business. Now, some, I mean, that's not every, every nonprofit, but you almost have to have two target markets as a nonprofit because you have your target market, which is the people that actually you're trying to help. And then your other target market is the ones who are going to give you the money to help you go do that. And so your donors become another target market and you have to have content for both. Like you have to have a marketing strategy, both for, you know, how to get your nonprofit out there to people who need it but then also to get it out to donors and they're going to be a lot of times completely different target markets. Right. So, you know, if you're helping homeless people and you're looking for donors, like those are not going to be the same people, probably people who have enough money, uh, money to donate to nonprofits probably like aren't homeless just, you know, so, you know what I mean? So like a lot of times you have to, you specifically have two entirely different target markets that you have to think about and you have to, you know, be consistent, have a brand that you have built that is consistent with both. And so one that will be caring and compassionate with the, the people that you're trying, the, with whatever subject you're trying to do, uh, help and to, and to, you know, educate, support, whatever your nonprofit does, but then you have to figure out how to get to those donors and be able to fund it so you can keep those doors open and keep, keep helping people. So nonprofits are fun, but yeah, the big difference there is you have two completely different products and target markets. <laughs> all right uh all right folks last chance for questions so get them in i'll give you another minute here to type some stuff in um but yeah man jeff i can't thank you enough this has been an awesome awesome meeting and uh i you know it's it's one of those topics where it's not our normal cup of tea for the user group i mean we don't usually talk about this kind of stuff um there's some other groups in town that would normally kind of cover this kind of stuff yeah. um you know, and uh, I know Jane's on here. This 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 sounds like it'd probably be a good media pros meeting as well. Um, but uh, but yeah, it it is. I, like I said before, I think it's so vital for anybody working in our industry to know this kind of stuff. I mean, in, no matter what business you're in, really, but especially for us video folks. Yeah, I mean, um, both, both from a business standpoint and for just you know uh, helping our clients. Again, like when I was doing like starting Star Fox Media, I did the same thing with my film production company too, is like we found kind of a need in the market, right? Which is like, there's a lot of really talented filmmakers out there, but they don't necessarily have the business acumen, right? So we would like our, our film production company, we'd help them with the packaging, the financing, the marketing and the distribution, like all the ancillary parts that like, you know, the non, the not sexy, non-creative work, you know, that everyone wants to make the film, but no one wants to support the film. So like, you know, we made sure to focus on those things. And I had the kind of the same mindset with Star Fox Media is like, if we can smart start or work with these small businesses, 
honestly, freelancers is like exactly what we made this for because freelancers have usually a, they're extremely technically savvy and knowledgeable about what they do, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a good business person. Right. And that's, and to be a successful, you know, freelancer, you kind of need to have both. So it's like for the people who aren't necessarily good at both, well, we can kind of get your back a little bit, <laughs> cover you, cover you at least on the marketing side and, you know, and the, some of the business strategy pieces. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. So we have one other question from Jane. She wants to know, perhaps this was covered earlier. What is the biggest misconception by our clients about the role of social media? I think, I mean, when it comes to, so like almost every marketing technique has a, a similar misconception that if you do a good job at that one, that's all you have to do or that like you only have to do social media or that you only have to do email or you only have to like, and a lot of these different things, when you set up these funnels, they work so much in tandem with each other. Like a social media post on its own doesn't necessarily get you sales unless it's like an ad that has a built-in call to action with a call you button. You know what I mean? Like those are the only social media posts that do anything on their own. And so for a social media post to turn into a, an, in, into an actual like actionable sale or something at the end of the day, it has to direct them to a place. It has to have them reach out to you. It has to, you know, have that call to action. It has to, and it has to get to people in, in like kind of almost like create that brand awareness and the, um, and then the, there's not a really a good marketing term for this. And so like, just how much people like you though, your like brand likability, right? Like, and, and create that rapport with them all within one, so like, you know, within social media, which is very difficult to do. So certain platforms do better at certain things. And so having a more well-rounded marketing strategy that includes a little bit of each piece and, but not just willy nilly, but strategically where you send them from this platform to this platform for this reason, like that's gonna be your most effective, like, you know, marketing technique and strategy. And so the biggest thing that I think people get wrong is just like, all I need to do is like make posts, you know, and that's it. And so, or another misconception that I think is applies again to most kinds of content marketing, but is that your content has to be about your product, which is just also not true. Your content can be about anything that bridges the gap between your target market and you. So as an editor, you don't have to only talk about editing. You can talk about video production. You can talk about film financing. You can talk about anything that's like, you know, that your target market is going to be interested in. And because, you know, all of those things can get them to your website. All of those things can get them to talk and follow you and can, and, you know, you help them out with anything like, you know, it can be technical knowledge about a Premiere Pro. It could be, you know, just to show that you know what you're doing and to help people that are, you know, trying to edit themselves, then find out it's really hard. And that, you know, it's not something that they can just, you know, watch one tutorial and make a professional video after it. Like, you know, so you can make all different kinds of content and, you know, you just want to make content that is, that fits your brand, like who, what your brand's persona is and that resonates with your target market. <laughs> I think that's a great answer. So, um, so yeah, uh, let's see. Any last questions before we wrap it up here? Okay, all right. Well, Jeff, I can't thank you enough, man. Like I said, this meeting was utterly amazing. It was so great, and um, you know, I, I learned so much. And like I said, don't be surprised if you get a call from me in the near future, just because yeah. you know I'm going to need to know some of this stuff, and I might be picking your brain more. So, um, but yeah, I can't thank you enough for showing up. Um, and Man. thanks to DJ for telling me about like about the group and uh, and for inviting me because that's you know like I love editors like you guys are awesome like I've tried editing and and like you know I dabble and I feel like when I do editing video editing it feels a lot like when I'm doing web programming or something like like you know like like coding and stuff like that it it hits that same part of your brain where it's like that minutia like watching the same clip a thousand times, getting that transition perfectly is, is like looking through a entire field of code for the one letter you got wrong. Like it's, it's a dark, dark art. I mean, it's, it's, you know, so yeah, I appreciate you guys. <laughs> thank you very much for coming, dude. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, all right, folks, that is it for this. Oh, wait, we got one more thing here. Uh, let's see. Tim. 
Uh, by the way, my major's in college, management information systems accounting. So I got some of this as part of basic business classes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, that is true. Um, all right. Well, thank you again, Jeff. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Again, this will be up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, so if you want to relive it or go back and watch anything, I know I'm probably going to do that tomorrow as well. Um, you can do it there on our YouTube channel. And remember, next month's meeting is our member showcase. So start figuring out what you want to show. Be sure and let us know uh, if you feel comfortable meeting in person or if you don't. We'll, you know, we're going to try to figure out whether to do this virtually or in person. And so thinking about topics you want to see us cover for 2022, which I can't believe it's 2022. It's like, holy crap, you know, where did this year go and how are, should we be flying in cars at this point? But that's the topic for another day. Um, anyways, thank you again, Jeff, and we will see you all next month. Bye-bye. See everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.